Wow, thank you so much, Marcus, for that fascinating talk. All I can say is I wish I'd had you at GCC Maths. Um, <laughs> we're, we're now going to move on to some questions. Audience, that is your cue. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, wherever it is on your screen. Um, while you do that, audience, I'm going to ask a few of my own, if that's okay, Marcus. Um, so you are Simone Chair for the Public Understands of, of, of Science, and I'm sure everyone would agree that that was an incredibly compelling and, and interesting talk. We unfortunately live in a, an anti-vax, flat earth, post-truth world, and the people who believe that stuff often get the most attention. But I think that it's time to look at the people who are communicating. And, and so just curious, what annoys you the most about modern science communication? And are there any specific styles or, or, or tropes that you're trying to change? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to be incredibly... Uh, dismissive of, of other people's opinions and especially when, when you know you're sitting on the right answer somehow uh, i mean so i think that there, there needs to be a, a little bit of humility sometimes involved com combined with a confidence of, 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 of knowing that we seem to have the best um way to, to look at this problem I, I think you know scientists we've had to admit especially during this period that um there are a lot of unknowns un out there and people are hankering for certainty so when the scientists you know we have to do this we have to um s uh, reveal the things we we cannot know or don't know yet um so when you compare that with somebody who's giving uh, what seems to be um uh, uh, an answer which is very confident that they know what's going on people often will will want the the answer that um seems to be confidently telling you what what's going on so but we, we have to be very cautious of that balancing uh um uh, revealing what we don't know but trying to to, to compete against those who are, are giving competently um kind of uh the the wrong sort of stories i and i think the word story is very important here because um there was actually a um research done which was published in nature um which illustrated one of the problems for us as science communicators is that it's very hard to undo a story. So when uh, somebody tells an anti-vax story about one person that they know that got vaccinated and then seemed to something went wrong, um, that story is very powerful um, and it's hard to overturn it. And so we will we will uh, you know get to, to give all the data that's available, give the numbers and things like that. But that doesn't seem to be very powerful in in undermining that story. And um, uh, I mean I. Uh, George Monbiot says in in his book Out of the Wreckage, um, uh, the only way to replace a story is with another story. Now that's very unscientific. So you know the the unscientific way would be to then tell a story of somebody who was saved because they had the vaccine vaccine or um, you know the death from measles that didn't have the vaccine. But that's very hard for us as scientists to just take one data point and use that. So, but I think that the evidence from that Nature paper is that we perhaps do need to um, to use the power of storytelling combined with the the data to be able to be most effective. Mm, that's that's fascinating. Uh, speaking of stories, you know, we obviously tell ourselves stories all the time. I tell myself I'm terrible at maths. I actually am, but but it's a story that we tell ourselves. And also, there are plenty of people who, you know, whether they're women or people of color, say I, it's a story of I don't belong in STEM, probably for for you know fair reasons in 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 the sort of climate that we live in you speak of shortcuts like you know everyone can just do them and it's just easy to do but obviously there's a lot of confidence in in picking a shortcut and finding one and, and going with it what would you say to someone who doesn't have the confidence in in picking a shortcut and, and running with it yeah well i i think uh confidence is uh key here so i mean i i find actually with my phd students you know they're going into the unknown and, and very often they uh you know it's the first time being faced with a problem that we don't know the solution to and i, and I think 50% of my time as a PhD supervisor is spent being a psychologist rather than a mathematician because giving people the confidence, and I think that's what gets undermined that too often in school setting, you're told this is not for you maybe, um, or you you have a one bad experience. And, and because mathematics is a kind of building up this pyramid, one faulty layer kind of screws you for the the rest of the 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 building that you're trying to to make um uh, so I, I think that you know what i try to do with my books is to uh and i hope this book illustrates that is 
to find different stories, as you say, which will resonate with you and then um, give you the motivation that, um, oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I want to to have a better memory. Um, oh, I see that patterns are a very key way. Uh, mathematical patterns are a good way to build up um, a kind of a, um, a good memory. So, so, so now I'm going to learn about patterns or something like that. So um, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's I, I find that mathematics is everywhere. And so to try and get somebody excited is to find what they're interested in and to reveal the mathematics there. And that starts to, 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 to engage them with realizing, oh, well, this, this could actually help me in what, what it is I'm doing. Mm. So actually that's so prompted by what you were saying there, Jeanette has, has written and said, many people seem happy to admit that they are um, innumerate. Uh, is that innumerate? Innumerate, yes, innumerate. exactly. Um, what would you encourage uh, math teachers and things like that to, to do? And I think in the book, you also talk about how maths deserves its its core place in, in the subject roster. Um, but maybe your, your thoughts on the wider maths curriculum and how you can teach maths and how you can encourage people and things like that. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I think I was very lucky I mean, I just went to my local comprehensive school, but I had this fantastic teacher um, that was very inspiring. I mean, he told us stories, um, uh, but he also kind of let us uh, understand that mathematics was much more than just a hard slog computation. Um, and I, for me, actually, I, I, I spent some time uh, with the Department of Education trying to un uh, encourage them to have a second GCSE in maths, which you might think is, well, that's a terrible idea, you know, I don't, one is enough. But, but my idea was um, that in, in English, you see, uh, you have English language and English literature. And the literature is the fun bit because you get to read some Shakespeare, some poetry, perhaps some modern, you know, George Orwell. Um, and the, the language is kind of necessary, but rather boring. Um, uh, so I feel like we've got a maths language GCSE which does all the technical things but n all, all the magic is not there and we need a kind of maths literature which would be kind of exciting things about infinity um, uh, four-dimensional cubes uh, used in movies or something um, or you know the magic of Fibonacci numbers in nature um, and uh, that that would or maths and music for example there's so much uh, maths hiding in music um, uh, and I, I think that would help people to fall in love with the subject and, and see the, the, the point of it. And then they'll, I mean, it's a bit like learning a musical instrument. If you just do scales and arpeggios, it's boring. But if you play a piece of music or listen to a piece of music, you say, okay, I want to do that. And I know I have to do the technical stuff to get there. So, so I, I, I just wish there was space for some mathematics without utility, um, just for the love and beauty of it. Mm. I mean, I remember looking at a friend of mine's uh, math textbook at uni and there were no numbers in it. They're all just letters and shapes and patterns. And I think just even knowing that maths could be something different would be very inspiring. Yeah, I think, you know, too many people think maths is arithmetic. Mm. And in some ways, what my teacher, that story of Gauss adding numbers from one to 100 is try and get away from doing arithmetic and find some clever pattern, which means that, you know, you don't have to do the hard work of arithmetic and you, you find the pattern. And, um, and that's really what maths is about. Mm -hmm. So speaking of cutting through the hard work, uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, do you have any tips on how to cut through work efficiently? And just more generally, like, do, do you use shortcuts in your everyday life? Um, are there sort of more quotidian bits and bobs? <laughs> you can yeah, uh, um, it, it's interesting because it's because strangely, what I've understood in my kind of journey through life is that um, sometimes it's quite fun when things are hard and difficult because when you solve them, um, they're so much more satisfying. So I mean, I spend my life trying to come up with these new mathematical shortcuts, which will then be there for people to exploit after uh, I've, I've found them. I mean, it's a bit like digging a tunnel. Dig the first time you dig a tunnel, it's a lot of hard work, it takes you a long time. But once the tunnel's there, it's um, you know there for everyone to use. So so I, I must admit, you know, a lot of my time I. I trying to find shortcuts but I, I, often it's the the long way and, and and often a detour and that's something that came up in a number of the people that I talked to um, taking detours can quite often help you um, to discover um, the shortcut you know perhaps going in the wrong direction to start with but that's what finds you kind of the the clever way to do something so sort of going and kicking against the the trend of what other people are doing is often a way of, of potentially finding those shortcuts the other thing I do a lot is I 
I, I do a lot of different things. So I, I, you know, I do a lot of mathematics, but I, I enjoy working with composers. I have a center in the Royal Northern College of Music looking at called Prism uh, with a composer there. Um, I do sort of theater work. So I'm working, wrote a play and I'm working with um, uh, uh, some actors and, uh, and I kind of enjoy changing things up. And I find that that refreshes me that when I come back um, to a, a problem, by having done a lot of other things, it's almost like I've re rearranged the brain such that it's sort of uh, things look different when I, I when come back the, the next time. So I think that's very powerful. And also, like Robert McFarlane said when I talked to him, walking is a very good way of uh, finding solutions to problems. It seems to be um, uh, just the, and actually train journeys. My best mathematical discoveries have been made on trains so trains are my kind of shortcut to uh solving problems weirdly so actually you know exactly on that line and, and walking diana i think wants you to spend more time on that um she asks um in maths you prefer taking the shortcut but people you know play music and they they hike and they maybe enjoy taking the slow route um she asks what do you think is the difference i, I think you touched on that a little bit with the actually enjoying the the exercise but Maybe yes, and I think, um, you know, that was my point about the distinction be that Aristotle made between praxis and poesis that, um, uh, you know, some work you enjoy doing for, for its own sake and, and that you should celebrate. So, you know, Robert McFarlane said, you know, I, I could get a, um, a cable car up to the top of a mountain, but that defeats the object. I enjoy, uh, you know, the journey um, up to the top. I remember we were going for a walk. Uh, you know, we rented a cottage in the Lake District and we set out with my family on a day walk. Um, and we, we, we'd got about half an hour into the walk. And then my son suddenly saw this path uh, going back across a field to the house that we'd rented. Uh, and he said, Dad, there's a, there's a shortcut back to the beginning. You know, we don't have to go for the walk. Um, and it kind of made me realize, no, well, you know, there is genuine uh, joy in actually going from A to A, but taking six hours to do it. Um, so I think it, it's absolutely right. It's about you, the choices you want to make. So sometimes the shortcut isn't appropriate um, and, and that's absolutely fine. But what you don't want is where there is a shortcut, um, uh, I would like to be, a, a, and it's a shortcut which kind of cuts out work I don't really want to do. Um, uh, then, you know, for example, uh, I will take a shortcut to get up to the Lake District um, to be able to start my walk. Um, so it's about the 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 you know w which bit of that work equation uh, are, are you on? Are you enjoying the work for its own sake? That's that's you know the higher form of communism, as Karl Marx said. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I, I don't think Marx could have predicted where he was being, being going to be used, but um, on a prezi is, is, is better than any. Um, so you mentioned just there that, that, you know, you're on a walk and you sat back and you responded to something your son said through the lens of shortcuts. Uh, a brilliant question from an anonymous attendee said, how does maths help in understanding people? You know, do, do you think that you see the world differently to someone who doesn't see it through shortcuts and maths? Yeah, well, I think this is very interesting because it relates in a way to the discussion I had with uh, about therapy um, mm. and shortcuts. Uh, so I talked to two therapists, Fiona Kennedy and Susie Orbach. Um, and uh, it, it was very interesting how the use of patterns and, uh, you know, diagrams to be able to illustrate uh, uh, kind of uh, faulty behavior, for example. I mean, that um, uh, very often, uh, you know, depression happens because a certain trigger of events. And if you can understand that kind of uh, algorithm that, you know, if, if this happens, then I do this and then I do this. Uh, and uh, in CBT, for example, which is a kind of shortcut therapy, uh, one the Labour government um, put a lot of money into because they realised it would uh, get people back to work and, and pay for itself. Um, this is a kind of uh, the, the power of a, a th therapeutic uh, uh, modality which uses a kind of diagram and kind of uh, uh, patterns of behavior and algorithms to understand people such that they can get control of their own uh, mm. kind of mental health and thought processes so so I think there are uh, powerful ways and I, and I would suggest looking at that therapy chapter to which illustrates that, that there are powerful ways that you can use pattern and maths and diagrams uh, to help understand help people understand themselves um but sometimes, again, if you're trying to change brain structure, um, you know, often the things which are very difficult to shortcut when I was talking to people like Na Natalie Klein, the cellist, or, or uh, Subzi Orbach made the same point. Is if you're trying to change a body, that takes time. 
you know, it's a muscular thing. You can't become an, an athlete uh, via a shortcut. Uh, even taking drugs, you know, you've got to combine that with um, uh, with a lot of hard work. And, and Natalie Klein made the point as a cellist that um, actually uh, uh, it wouldn't be so much fun if, if it wasn't hard, uh, which was interesting. So, you know, she, she's glad there's no shortcut to playing the Bach suites because she, that's the joy of finally getting there. Oh, so one final question, I hope it prods some, some inspiring things as well, because that was a lovely answer. Um, at the beginning of your book, you seem very, very keen to say, to sort of dispel some myths about the shortcut. And I think this is one moment where you say, whenever I mention shortcuts, people think I'm trying to cheat. Um, was there anything, you know, what message do you not want people to get from your work, from, from your book? Like, is, is there anything that you were worried about being kind of crib noted or misinterpreted? Um, I Yes, I, I think uh, that is one that uh, shortcuts is the same as cutting corners. It's not uh, a shortcut. A good shortcut is one that genuinely gets you to your to your the destination that you that you you want. Um, uh, but the second one is that um, y you know shortcuts are hard to find, uh, and that was a sort of um, uh, you know I, I started doing mathematics because I was a lazy teenager and I enjoyed this kind of uh, you know these fast ways of doing things but ultimately when i became a mathematician as i said i spent i spent a, a long time trying to come up with that moment with a ha moment where suddenly i i find the 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 tunnel which is going underneath the mountain um but a, a bit like natalie klein that's the that's the joy of doing mathematics is actually um sometimes doing the hard work to find that shortcut that hopefully everyone else can use once i've opened up that tunnel are you saying that the real treasure is the friends we made along the way? Well, you know, interesting that Gauss uh, um, also kind of hinted that, you know, part of it is the journey that, um, uh, but yeah, it's interesting, you know, because shortcuts kind of in literature get rather a hard, uh, you know, uh, not a great press. They generally end in disaster. So, um, <laughs> so I suppose I'm trying to rescue as well the shortcut from, um, you know, the idea of Homer Simpson arriving at uh, Itchy and Scratchy Land saying, we shall never talk of that shortcut again. Yes, or um, of course it was hard because it was a shortcut. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, well, okay, well, sadly, we're going to have to end now. I could speak to you for hours. Months. Um, as mentioned, though, audience, please do check out the new book, Thinking Better, The Art of the Shortcut, um, and do head over to our website, The How to Academy. Uh, there it is. Uh, yep, uh, and, do, and do head out to the, over to the How to Academy website to see uh, the, the rest of our speakers for the next couple of months. Uh, speaking of exciting speakers, Marcus, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Thank you, audience, for all your amazing questions. We hope to see you all very soon. Marcus, final word to you. Well, uh, thanks for the audience for joining me on my journey. I hope that, that was your shortcut to the world of shortcuts. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much and have a good night.